Hi, this is Randy Finney with Right Side of the Chart, and today is Tuesday, April 4th, 2017. In this video, I want to do a follow-up. Yesterday, I covered the, um, oh, what did I cover yesterday? The bank sector, the financials. And um, there are quite a few other, just a few other key sectors that, that I wanted to touch on, and I'll do that in this video. Time permitting, I'll do a market wrap. I wanted to do that yesterday, but there really, there wasn't anything to note. Uh, other than the fact, every index traded down. Um, but one day doesn't make a trend, so I don't want to read too much into that. There just wasn't any uh, technical developments in the chart other than that a lot of the market stopped at some of the key fib and resistance levels that I pointed out. And, um, you know, we, we just need to see uh, the lows from the previous Monday taken out before we get uh, too excited on the on the bearish side. So let's just take a look at some of the sectors that stand out to me right now. There may be trading ops here for some of you. Uh, if you like individual stocks or you trade the sector ETFs, so we're going to start out with the automotive sector. Um, you know, just recently, I've, I've been, this is a sector I've been following for a while, been quite bearish, um, you know, looking at new car sales, just going crazy. And, and that has been a function, as we all know, of uh, art of these artificially low interest rates, uh, a lot of incentives from the manufacturers. And um, so what I see, uh, you know, not really any different to the housing uh, bubble in 2007, topped in 2006, it's just a glut of houses when you, you know, that's what we had going on back then. They were building too many homes. Credit was too lax. People were speculating buying homes as flipper to flip, not to live in. And when you do that, you have a, uh, an excess inventory of homes and it took a while to clear out. And as you guys all know what happened to home prices after that. And the same thing happens. You know, every industry is, is has its cycles. And, you know, we, we're coming off um, a huge um, cycle in the autom automotive industry here. Let me pull a chart, show you guys what I'm talking about. All right, here's a, a chart going back um, for years. I think I hit the max data period. Um, there's some longer term ones out there, but you can see at least going back into the, looks like the early 90s or so, um, this is U.S. total vehicle sales. And um, as most of you know, we've had in the last few years, we've had uh, three uh, bull market tops followed by bear markets. And that was the peak back in, in March of 07. Oops, try to get that right here. Um, the stock market, the tech bubble popped or the dot-com bubble popped in March of 2000. That's when that bear market started. And as you can see, auto sales topped back then. We also had a, a bull market that topped in October of 2007. I don't know where the hash marks for the years are on here. I don't see those, but somewhere around there. And um, here we are today. So the point, the point I'm trying to make is here's where auto sales have just recently peaked. And you can see... Barring these, um, what I like to call errant spikes, you have these, you know, these crazy spikes. I don't know what 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 caused such a uh, abnormal spike. You had one down here. So I, I, I personally, I dismiss things like this. I'm not trying to confirm my own bias. I just, if I see an errant spike like that, um, you know, if you looked at a trend line, any type of uh, smoothing, you know, moving average or anything, those those wouldn't appear there. So point being, again, here we are at the high end of the range uh, for auto sales. And like everything else, just like the economy, it moves in cycles. It has its booms and busts. And, um, you know, I, I think it's safe to say this has been one of, although the, the, the drop-off was one of the sharpest, but again, we're now very, very, very long in this cycle, just like the stock market where getting long in the tooth. This has been, you know, what, seven years or so of expanding auto sales and we're at record levels now. And simply put, there's just too many new cars on the road. And, um, you know, there was a Morgan Stan Stanley analyst that came out recently suggested that uh, used cars prices might drop as much as 50% over the next five years. Um, and I can easily see that happening. Um and, you know, he, he cited various things in there, um, rising interest rates, used car inventories, um, high incentives automakers are pumping out. Also talking about how all the newer cars now, there's just a, a tremendous improvement in technology. For, you know, for many years, we didn't see a whole lot of new car, you know, new cars. They change their models once in a while. The styling would differ. Now we're getting these technological advances 
um, you know, with these in-screen, uh, uh, you know, Bluetooth-enabled, Wi-Fi. Uh, a lot of them are connected to 3 and even 4G networks now. Um, I'm talking about the little in-screen in dashes that integrate your AC, your your stereo system, your cell phone, they, you know, navigation, all that kind of good stuff. And so what that's doing is making, you know, it, it, it's giving people more of a bump to buy a new car. Um, and so anyways, those are all fundamental factors that play into it. So I'm, I'm seeing some dark clouds on the horizon for the automotive industry. And that's a big industry. Um, you know, it's an important industry here in the U.S. So let me let me clear this chart out. Get back to we'll just look at a few of the individual automakers, some of the big ones. Here's Ford. This is a daily chart, um, pretty well defined. This is a um, it's not quite symmetrical, but almost it's a triangle pattern nonetheless. There it is on the daily chart, and uh, you know just keep an eye to see which one which way this one breaks. That'll likely determine the next direction in Ford. Here's a longer term chart. We had this uptrend line that broke back here in 2013. Ford has been in a downtrend since. So Ford, um, actually, Ford pe peaked all the way back here in 2011 and has never seen those highs again. So um, again, does that jive with this uh, auto sales at, at you know near record highs, uh, at least at the ho historic end of their range, yet Ford peaked back here? Um, that tells me there's some fundamental issues with the company. I mean, uh, so either way, there it is, you know, it's, it's just moved along, been dead, uh, dead money to slightly downward trending trade since, uh, 2011. So let's look at a couple other, the big ones, GM, General Motors. Here's an uptrend line to watch. Recently you had this very steep and well-pronounced divergent high. Uh, you can see the negative divergence here on the PPO and the RSI. Uh, there's a trend line to watch. This, that divergence has already started to play out and has so far to this point, Point to resulted in a correction, a drop of over 12%. Uh, let's see what the weekly chart. Here's a weekly chart. Now, this is interesting. You have a, a, a large, uh, almost a symmetrical triangle here on the weekly time frame. This chart goes back all the way to 2011 uh, when GM restructured. And you can see that we broke above that, and that was bullish. Um, but so far, we've come all the way back in to t test that, back test that triangle, and we br we're, we're at a level lower than we broke out now. If we fall back in, that will be a failed breakout, a false breakout. And it wouldn't surprise me in the least to see GM come all the way back down to, at minimum, come in here and test this downtrend line, or this uptrend line. And that's the drop of, a, of roughly, depends where it hits at another 12% or so. So uh, one to watch. And, and, and due to the divergences, these may have more to play out, especially if this trend line goes. That would also coincide. You can see horizontal support there at 3338 uh, well, pretty well-defined price resistance, as well as that downtrend line. So really a move down below that level there, both these levels would also pull us back into that triangle. And I don't see any decent support here on the daily chart to at least the 3027 area. Uh, so there's one to watch. Uh, next up, what else do we have? We have, okay, we know Tesla, well, big news headlines the other day just overtook Ford and is, uh, in market cap. So now this is actually a larger company as measured by market cap, which is simply all the, you know, you add up all the shares of the stock out there. And um, uh, so, you know, it's been strong recently, it had this very tight price channel, broke down, uh, had a little correction following the breakdown of this steep ascending price channel, found support right at horizontal support, well-defined support. And these are all lines I had on the chart before it even broke from this channel. Moved back up and recently broke out to a new high yesterday. Hooray, up 7.27%. It's a new high I wouldn't chase. It's a divergent high. Uh, that divergence is yet to be confirmed. We need to see the PPO cross back down. That will confirm it. And maybe that maybe there's a little more upside here. You can extend this divergent line when we had this first divergent high. Maybe we turn down there. Um, maybe we turn down sooner. Maybe we take out those divergences, and that would be bullish uh, if we can take out the divergences. But right now they're there. Uh, let's see if this breakout to new high sticks. Uh, so far it was on high volume yesterday, but again, uh, work to be done. Longer term, it's not drawn out here, but we're, we've really been diverging on, on Tesla for, for years. Tesla, the story on Tesla, uh, technical story that is, you guys know everything that they got fundamentally. Um, here we go. There's a, just a multi-year sideways trading range. So Tesla, other than this, pure, uh, this brief false breakdown slash bear trap, 
uh, snap back into the channel. Um, maybe this is the real deal here, here. Maybe not. You know, Tesla, it's all about the that new, what is it, Model S, that, that 30 something thousand dollar model they're trying to get out by the end of the year. We'll see uh, how much of that's priced in the stock already. I don't know. And also how much will fl flagging auto sales affect that? You know, Tesla's going to have a challenging uh, market and, and coming up here if, if everything I said is true, if there's a glut. Um, and going back to what I said about used car prices dropping, well, if you say, well, Randy, what does that have to do with used car prices drop by 50%? How does that affect new cars? Well, that's competition. You know, if you bought a car, you know, 2017, 2016 now in a year or two, or you're rolling off a lease and there's an almost like new used car out there uh, and you can, you know, prices have plummeted. Um, that makes people think twice about going in the dealership and dropping 30, 40, 50,000 or more on a new car. Um, when you can get a used car out there for, you know, half the price or less, that's, that's hardly used. So not a good thing if the used car, uh, market drops. All right. A couple more. We'll wrap up TM Toyota motor company, uh, potential big, uh, inverse, I'm sorry, not inverse, a regular head and shoulders, uh, topping pattern here. Um, you can see a left shoulder head, right shoulder here's a, a downward sloping neckline so just one to watch and it also that neckline currently comes in right around uh horizontal support there so that's that's something to watch longer term near term there's some potential bullish divergences again i use the word potential because the macd or in this case the ppo is still pointing down and this divergence may not not um, come to fruition so if if it doesn't if the PPO takes out that previous reaction low, we no longer have bullish divergence. But in this, at this point in time, we have potential divergence. So maybe Toyota is due for a little bounce here. There's a trend line there you can watch. You can probably draw an alternate trend line like this off these points here. Uh, so maybe a, a rally in there. But you know, bigger picture is just like Ford. This is a stock that topped years, ago, or at least a while back. Here's 2015. We can see a top. Uh, it's also the head of that inverse head and shoulders pattern. And so here's a company, again, my point being, we're in a booming um, new car sale environment where, you know, uh, near record high levels, and yet something's going on here. So uh, I always say this, and, and the stock market looks out at least six to nine months ahead. Um, so if you have these automakers that are, their, their stocks are down, in this case, 25%, um, in the last year or so, year and a half, yet auto sales are you know record highs. What's going on here? How if they're not making money right now, how are they going to do <laughs> in a challenging auto environment going forward? So don't underestimate how much more downside potential is left in these stocks. All right, that's one sector. We'll move on. I covered the financials yesterday. Biotechs I highlighted just before the close at a breakdown here. There's several biotech ETFs. This is one of them. This is a XBI. Uh, I like to track this one. Uh, I keep an eye on all of them, but this is you know my favorite. Uh, and if you're trading LABU or LABD, keep in mind those particular three-time leveraged ETFs, are, uh, those are the bullish and bearish ones. They track the same sector, the Spiders S&P Biotech ETF sector, whereas uh, some of the other ones track the uh, NASDAQ Biotech sector, which only includes NASDAQ Biotech stocks. And yeah, a lot of the biotech stocks are in the NASDAQ. There is a lot of overlap between these sectors. The charts will be very similar, but uh, just keep that in mind. So I... Uh, even if I trade LABU or LABD, I'll always chart off XBI, which is the one time, the non-leveraged, because you don't have the decay in the charts. You get a more accurate longer-term picture. So what is that longer-term picture? I know there's a lot of, um, I probably should have given you a cleaner version of this chart, but the salient levels to watch are this, these yellow trend lines, this uptrend line here, and this yellow downtrend line here. That forms a symmetrical triangle pattern. I've pointed that out quite a bit recently and the white lines within are just you know rising wedges broke down bullish falling wedges broke out uh, this one broke out came back in had a little you know correction to alleviate the overbought conditions and then powered on through broke above the symmetrical triangle pattern so longer term that was a bearish technical event uh, and it did play out for quite a rally so far. 
went right up. I had this $73 resistance level here for a while. You can see the previous reaction highs, some reactions around there. There's a gap and some reactions in there. And we hit that uh, 73 level. And so far, we've come back in. And as of yesterday, what I was pointing out, just before the close, we broke below that line. Now, I didn't add this as an official short trade. You guys do what you want to do. I'm waiting for just a little bit more evidence. I've had for a couple weeks now, we'll say, a short position on LABU. Uh, I like to, this is one that, this is an ETF that is chock full of decay, not XBI. I'm talking LABU and LABD because the biotechs are one of the most volatile sectors. They have a lot of sharp up and down days. And especially when you don't have a, a, a very powerful trend, you get a trend like this, you can you can buy LABD, the three-time bearish, and do well because that's a uni, what I call a unidirectional trend, a nearly straight you know, consistent drop. When you get in these choppy markets, this is where the decay kicks in. Um, even during this wedge, it was a bit choppy. Yes, the trend was down, but a lot of up and down closes, and that's what causes decay. So um, if I'm not mistaken, let me look at another screen here. I can't even tell you how long it's been. It's been a little while in there. Yeah, I'm, I'm profitable on the LABU short. Not by a whole lot, um, but, but slightly profitable. I guess it was somewhere up in here. Uh, I might have shorted it back here. I can't even remember, to be honest with you. I have so many positions. But uh, this one may be an active trade. Here's what we're watching. This is the breakdown I pointed out yesterday. Here's a pretty well-defined uptrend line. One, two, three, almost three, four, quite a few reactions. And then that breakdown yesterday. Um, so let's see if there's follow-through. And I'm also paying a lot of attention to the broad markets. Um, the biotechs, just like I said with the financials in that video yesterday, if there is going to be a considerable amount of downside from here, you're going to need the broad markets to cooperate. Um, the NASDAQ has a quite a bit of biotech exposure. Um, so, um, you know, I doubt we're going to see the QQQ head up another 20% uh, to the upside from here while the, while the biotechs drop 20%. I just don't see that happening. So there's a story. This is a 120-minute one, uh, or two-hour period chart. Um, you had a rising wedge here. You can see the divergence at the high. The divergences are marked. So um, that that's probably, uh, I guess that's maybe where I entered that position on the, on the LABU. And I'll be looking to add, but I'm also waiting to see a little bit of weakness. Confirmation that the, uh, the bounce in the, in the broad markets is over and was only indeed, uh, as I suspect, a counter trend bounce and a much larger correction that began on March uh, 1st in every index but the NASDAQ 100. All right, uh, so that's biotechs. There's a couple others out there. We'll just take a look to cover them all. Uh, there's um, IBB. And this is the iShares NASDAQ Biotech Index Fund. Uh, you can see a similar uptrend line, but we have some room to go there. And again, and again this is another thing giving me a little bit of pause here. So almost a wedge type pattern. We don't really have divergence because we have a higher peak in the PPO and the RSI. Uh, RSI is quite a bit oversold. Now that in itself is usually a heads up. You get these over... Um, Overbought, I should say, not oversold. Overbought readings like this. Uh, you're overbought here. Um, yes, we did manage to, we corrected from there, pushed up, made a marginal new high, but that was a divergent high with a lower low. So um, here we had a double tap. See, this is what I call a double tap two. Two overbought readings in close proximity. This was the first one. It did lead to a correction. This was the second one, and that was boom, lights out. Uh, so, you know, Basically, the, it's simple. When you get extended and you have persistent overbought readings, um, you don't have to fall. You don't have to have a bear market or correction, but it just means that the risk reward is not very attractive at that point, and you're better off going short than you are long. Likewise, um, this is when you want to buy the biotechs. See these oversold readings? This one was a divergent oversold reading. We had a oversold reading and a slightly higher oversold reading. Oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't divergent because price has never made a lower low. Either way, you could have went long at both of those. Um, so see, guys, this isn't rocket science. Just line up the, you know, look at all the indicators you can on the charts. Look at divergences. Look at overbought, oversold readings. And you can see how how each and every time it was over the biotechs were oversold on the daily time frame. Yeah, maybe you got in a day or two early, but uh, it paid off without fail, just as shorting or getting out when it was uh, overbought paid off. And uh, that's, that's the case most recently. 
All right, the only other one out there, I don't trade it much, or I don't trade it at all, really, PBE. This is the PowerShares Dynamic Biotech Portfolio ETF. It's just been grinding around in the space for a while. This one does have a divergent high. I'll draw it out here for you. Let me use actually a different drawing tool. You can see here, wrong tool. If I grab the line tool, you can see, uh, there's that line should it be. It's almost flat, slightly higher. Slight divergence, nothing very steep, but just some slight divergence there. Probably draw a trend line like this, and there's your pattern. So there's your sell signal on PB if you guys like to trade this one. Uh, support levels, I can tell you I don't see a whole lot down until about this area here. That's be my first target, about 38.70 or so. Uh, there's certainly, there's a gap there. There's a reaction there. That's, that'd be the first target. And bigger picture, you know, on all of these, you zoom back out to the longer term charts. The bigger picture, and I've maintained this for a long time. You know, I did a video up here calling for a bear market in the biotechs just a week, I think within a week after they topped. And we got that. And I've also made the case that, um, this whole rally in 2016 may simply have just been a, a counter trend rally or a, um, you know, a, a cyclical bull market within a secular bear market, a new bear market in the biotechs. The charts seem to indicate that the yellow line here is a primary uptrend line off the 2009 lows. Uh, we've dropped and we're, we back tested that trend line. Uh, you can see the retracement we've retraced. I uh, must have did these wrong. Yeah, that's not grab the lines backwards there. But of the bull market, and there it is, we retrace 61.8. So that's just a run of the mill Fibonacci retracement of the uh, bull market off the 2009 lows to the highs. And here's XBI. There's your primary bull market uptrend line. There's your drop 61.8% retracement to the button. Uh, so far, we failed there actually after another failure at the 61.8 Fib retracement again off the, where did I where did I use these lines? Uh, that was off this drop here from the drop on the highs down to the recent lows. So we retraced 61.8% of that. That's a key Fibonacci level. Um, there's your primary uptrend line. We're still well below that and still well below the 2015 highs. So, um, you know, it, it's hard to say with any degree of certainty right now, but the possibility is certainly there that um, maybe this is just simply a counter trend rally and a larger um, uptrend, uh, downtrend with, with more downside to come. And obviously we won't know that definitively until we break these lows back here. If, until, if, or until we break these lows from, what was that late 2015, early 2016. So just something to watch for, but we do have, um, the best way to tell if that looks like it's going to be the case. Again, go back to this daily chart on XBI, break of this trend line that we had yesterday. Let's see some follow through today or in the next few days, come back in. If we come all the way down and t back test the top of the symmetrical triangle, does that test hold and then uh, provide a launching point for the next leg up? If so, that might be bullish. However, if we move back down below that trend line, especially this uptrend line here, the triangle, the lower trend line extended, you know, the way it looks, they'll come in right around the apex or so if we drop now, if you can see, I'll draw that out for you. Let's say we broke at a little, oh, these drawing tools are driving me crazy. I select one and another one pops up. All right, this should be the arrow tool. So, you know, come down, bounce up, maybe come back in and test it again at a lower level. This will be a critical uh, at area and we also have a, a, a key support level there i have it in orange at 59.55 so there's a confluence of support right here if it takes that it would take us a few months to get down there uh but something to watch longer term on the biotechs all right let's just move on wrap this thing up semis smh there's that wedge i mean i've just that's i haven't seen a wedge like this in quite a while look at this price compression this speaks to something else i don't know if you guys are aware of this if you follow the journal or any it might have been in some of the other financial media uh just the uh they just ran an article that uh this last quarter that ended on friday march 31st or the end of yeah i believe it was march 31st was the least volatile quarter in over half a century. I think it goes back to 1965 in the Dow, I'm going from memory. Um, and they're talking about the average daily price swing in the Dow. 
and in the S&P, I think it goes back to 1967, so about 50 years there as well, give or take, uh, with the least, the average price, daily price swing in both the S&P and the Dow were the lowest they had been in at least half a century. And that's a, that's a big stat because that tells you from those areas of low price compression typically come explosive moves and volatility. So, you know, I talked about it for a while. The VIX has been trading at the low end of its range. Nothing happened. Um, and for those of you out there that are about to give up on trading, give up on all this stuff, just remember this is, this is you know, unique times. We haven't seen such low volatility in a quarter for over half a century. Um, you know, that's longer than I've been alive. I'm not, not by much, but by a few years. So either way, that's an interesting stat. And you can see it here with the semis. Yeah, the trend is up. I mean, I know there's people that just think the semis will never are unbreakable at this point and will never, ever again fall. Well, this is a very, very, very well-defined rising wedge. I mean, so many reactions on this trend line to validate it that I think when it breaks, and this is just my opinion, that we're not going to get a little limp down, kind of walk your way down, sideways correction or trading range. You're going to have a big impulsive move, uh, I believe, in a rush for the exit. Uh, that's usually what I see with these very well-defined um, patterns. So I think we'll see the in, at least the initial leg down. And that'd be a drop of, you know, if this thing breaks soon, about 7%, and that can happen in a flash. Uh, so if, you know, if you're long one of the three time leveraged ETFs, that's, you know, 21% plus drop. Um, but again, be careful if you don't know what you're doing with those leveraged ETFs. Uh, so there's the SMH again, nothing has changed since my last update. We continue to pinch our way, work our way up. I haven't even, I haven't even had to modify the trend lines in this one. It's just walking its way right up that wedge. There's XSD, another semiconductor ETF. That one has broken below its trend line, had a minor trend line break there and a break down there, but we haven't had any impulsive selling yet. Trend indicators are still bullish. And then you have one more SOXX, tracks the Philly Sox index. And um, there's the primary uptrend line, a little work to be done on that one. So that's why I haven't pulled the trigger on the semi short yet. Tech, uh, XLK. Uh, that it's just really, it was down yesterday. We're slightly ahead on the, on the official short trade for, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, S O C S I have to check. I forget the name of that, the, the symbol on that one, the three time, uh, short. And I still expect this is a flashpoint. We need to take out this 5255. And, uh, once we take that level out, I believe then the waterfall selling will start. It'll be a quick move down to T1. We'll either hit this trend line and or this uh, horizontal price level or about 50, 90, and then we'll have our first reaction, more than likely. Um, then once, if and when that trend line goes, these are all the targets down here, price targets, potential price targets, and that's via XLK. And this is TECS. This is the official trade idea here. Uh, and a quick word on this. Um, this, I'm going to show you the good and the bad for for TECS. Uh, let's just jump back. We, we can do it here or we can do it over on XLK. Uh, this is what you want to see. Unidirectional moves. What I mean by unidirectional moves are moves like this where you have, see all these green candles? That works very well. If you are long the three-time bullish um, tech sector ETF, you would have actually outperformed the move in XLK. Uh, and that's again, I, I detailed that in the post. So this is what for for the current uh, TECS position, this is what we want. See all these red candles, consecutive red candles. That makes for a good trade. That makes for a very good trade in TECS where you'll actually do better or very likely will do better than 300% what XLK does. This, however, is exactly what you don't want. Uh, sideways trading, a lot of green and red candles. Um, there's a opening bell market just opened. So let me wrap this thing up quickly, see if I have any other uh, things to cover. Yeah, I do. I do have one. Um, and I just wanted to con reiterate that I expect, uh, I still expect uh, some pretty impulsive selling once this thing kicks off. And I think that'll come, especially if and when the uh, broad markets break their recent lows. Uh, volatility. Keep in mind, guys, volatility is at still at historic, the historic end of its uh, lower end of its trading ranges. 
Here's a little minor downtrend line. The VIX looks ready to explode at any point in time. We had a little false start there, positive divergence, and that's the VIX. And don't forget about the VXN, the NASDAQ volatility index. And look at this thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, breakout, back test. Uh, bullish divergence. I don't have it all drawn out here. There's some divergence there. That's a daily chart. We look at a weekly chart, and this thing, if this goes back 10 years, we're at the lowest, we just hit the lowest point that the VXN, the NASDAQ Volatility Index, has hit um, in years. And if I throw up a chart, overlap a chart of, say, QQQ over that, let's see what's happened since then. Okay, here was a low right here. We hit a low and then we had a correction. We hit this low end of the range. The market flattened out, didn't do anything, and then dropped. Here was another low end tag of the range, big correction. Um, then volatility was elevated. So um, again, from the low ends of these ranges, usually mark a um, at least a correction or top. We rarely stay down once we hit these extreme low readings. We rarely stay back down. Volatility usually picks back up after that. So that's my expectation on the markets going forward. And I'll wrap this up here, and um, uh, next video I'll give an update. I'll, we'll watch what the broad market's doing. I'll, I'll try to update those either in static post or in a video uh, sometime today. This has been Randy Finney with Right Side of the Chart.